suppose that how the Cold War began is rather a contradictory title because the essence of the Cold War is that it was a war which was expected to begin but never actually began. However, I suppose we also know roughly what we have in mind by the term Cold War. It applies to some parts, shall we say, of the of international relations between Soviet Russia and the United States in the 30 years or so since the war, periods of tension. Now, international tension or difficulties between great powers is nothing like so unusual as people imagine. The, I was going to say the normal relation of sovereign powers is to distrust each other and uh, to pursue rival ambitions. All through the 19th century, for instance, Great Britain was either uh, running in rivalry to Russia or to France or in the early 20th century to Germany. Uh, nor is it unusual for uh, former allies to quarrel. In fact, the normal thing at the end of any great war is that the alliances break up and they uh, uh, fall out. In 1815, England and Austria, the victors, uh, made an alliance with France, their former enemy, against Russia, their former ally, who had indeed delivered uh, Europe from the conqueror. And if something the same happened in 1945, uh, this was only to be expected. There were, however, and still are, uh, deeper elements than the normal rivalry and distrust which great powers show for one another. For one thing, I think this is the most historical part of the background, there's, in some strange way, Russia, even when a great power, has never been fully accepted as part of Europe. There's always been an assumption that Russia was just on the fringe of Europe, was indeed quite often in the 19th century referred to as an Asiatic, an almost a, uh, an inferior power. In 1856, after the Crimean War, when somebody objected that the terms imposed on Russia were very harsh, much harsher incidentally than those imposed by Bismarck in, on France in 1871, Palmerston replied, well, what can an Asiatic power uh, expect. Uh, when Russia has claimed that she should be treated on the same level, has the same rights to make claims as other great powers, this is, produces not only uh, indignation, but surprise. In 1945, for instance, at the end of the uh, Second World War, when uh, the victors were first speculating as to how things should be uh, shared out. The British, who were hoping to still to maintain the whole of their empire and their domination of the Mediterranean, were astonished to learn that Russian statesmen hoped to acquire Libya. That's a very foolish thing to do, no doubt. But somehow it was more scandalous if the Americans had come along and said, we would like a colony in the Mediterranean, we've decided that Libya is the one. Nobody would have minded. Normal thing for a great power to do. For Russia to do it, a, an outrage, an uncivilized, an Asiatic thing. Similarly, in 1945, the British still controlled both ends of the Mediterranean, the Straits of Gibraltar and the Suez Canal. And this was said to be essential to their national security, though the Mediterranean, heaven knows, quite a long way away from this country. The Russians said that they would like to control the Straits of the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. This would give them an, an outlet. It was a good deal more important to them than Gibraltar and Suez were to the British. Immediately, the talk again of Russian aggression. Uh, but, of course, this has been strengthened by many other things. There is a greater division of ideology between Russia and the Western powers than between any of the Western powers themselves. This doesn't begin with communism. It begins with the religious cleavage that the Russians have the Orthodox Church. And there's another point. The Russians are, one must say, in their beliefs, very arrogant. They, their church is officially called the Orthodox Church. So what does that leave the rest of us with? I suppose we're all some kind of heretics, second-rate Christians compared to the truly Orthodox. And when you add to this Marxism, which again claims to know all the secrets, I was going to say, of the universe, but at any rate of the economic system, the Russians 
uh, Russian statesmen, Russian writers, I think have a, a, a determination to be right, a self-confidence which is asserted the more because others by no means always recognize it. There are considerations of more practical nature. Russia in the 19th century certainly had great conflicts with Great Britain as representing the West, uh, particularly in the Middle East. And then with the Russian Revolution, there followed a very great increase in the uh, cleavages when the Russians went Bolsheviks. And thing often forget, forgotten in the West, of course, that Great Britain and France, with some cooperation from America, conducted wars of intervention on a very considerable scale against the Bolshevik government. What the British and French did in 1919 was very much what the old reactionary powers had done against France in 1793. In this case, the wars of intervention were a failure, and though they did not provoke an actual counter-war on the part of Russia, they did not produce a revolutionary army and, well, they produced a revolutionary army, but not a victorious revolutionary army, and a new Bonaparte, they certainly uh, created hostility on both sides. And throughout the interwar period, and to, I'd go to say a lessening extent, but I'm not quite sure about that either, there has continued this antagonism, a deep base suspicion. Here again, Suspicion is the normal relationship between great powers. That is particularly true, of course, of the military advisers. After all, it is the job of generals and admirals and air marshals to prepare for wars. They can only prepare for war at all sensibly if they envisage an antagonist. And when they can't see a very obvious outstanding antagonist, in the way that, shall we say, the British general staff or, or chiefs of staff recognized before the war that Germany was likely to be the antagonist, then they find unlikely antagonists. In the 1920s, for instance, when Germany had almost ceased to exist as a military power and Russia had been forgotten, the air staff, in order to justify a large air force, invented the French peril. They argued that because France had a large air force, this was inevitably bound, be bound to used against Great Britain and therefore we must build a large air force in return. The large air force was not built but the alarm was sounded. I was reading just the other day a fascinating account of American military and strategic plans between the wars. Again at a time when neither Germany, Japan nor Russia was a danger. The American strategists had to justify themselves. They sounded the alarm that America, as always, was in danger. After all, if your country's not in danger, you wouldn't have an army and you wouldn't have an air force and you wouldn't have a navy. And that would never do for the people who are running the army and the air force and the navy. So what did the army strategists in America discover in the middle of the 1920s? They discovered that a country called Red, which was in fact the United Kingdom, was preparing to invade White, which was the United States, with an army of eight million men in order to destroy the whole of American industry. Now, this is not that's some fantasy of a novelist. This is a, was a serious strategical planner, trained in the staff colleges and sitting down in genuine alarm that at any day a new armada might be sighted crossing the Atlantic, landing in Canada, and then eight million British troops marching, I suppose, on, on Chicago. I guess you'd say a fantasy. They didn't take many steps about it. In fact, they did. The Americans recast their strategical thinking entirely in face of the supposed danger from the British on the one side and Japan on the other. And the reason why, in 1941, the Americans put Germany first is simply because they had put the other European danger, England, first, 15, 20 years before. So that you could imagine that where such suspicions exist, they are very easily built up. The suspicion and rivalry between Soviet Russia and the great powers, 
turned then partly, largely, on the historical record, on Russia's geographical position, and most of all, on the transformation of Russian society, which we call the Bolshevik Revolution. No such cleavage had existed in Western civilization since the time of the French Revolution. And even in the time of the French Revolution, the cleavage was, though fierce, relatively short. The cleavage between the state which claimed to be communist and the countries which called themselves democratic or capitalistic uh, or liberal, this cleavage which started in 1917 has endured to the present day. The, maybe argued the cleavages are now less, that our, all Western countries are becoming more communized, at any rate run by great corporations and not by individual enterprise, perhaps becoming less, less democratic too. Uh, it could hardly, I think, be called, be argued, that Soviet Russia is becoming more democratic. It is possible, however, that she's becoming less rigidly communistic. Nevertheless, the cleavage is still there. And I sometimes think that what people in the West dislike about Soviet Russia, or what many people dislike about Soviet Russia, is not the bad things in Soviet Russia, but the good ones. It's not so much that people dislike the labor camps, the suppression of freedom of thought, the constant thought control, the secret police. What many people really dislike, perhaps it applies even more than to Americans than to us, is that Russia has no capitalists and no private landlords. And this certainly was the grievance, the barbarism with which the Bolshevik Revolution started. And on the other side, the, the Bolsheviks, of course, look with suspicion to what they call the great capitalist enterprises. So much so that, on the one side, Marxism, which is, after all, a perfectly legitimate and uh, coherent system of economic thought, is used as a term of, of uh, abuse, of, of uh, imagining that anyone who's a Marxist can hardly be a I was going to say it can hardly be British at all, even though Marxism was, after all, invented uh, in the British Museum. No system of thought is more fully, integrally British than Marxism, but this is not how people think of it nowadays. Uh, how far this crusade of ideas still persists, it is difficult to say. In 1918, though, the Western powers wanted to grib, grab Russian territory as well. There's no doubt that they regarded Bolshevism, Marxism, as a really barbaric idea. Now I think it's only confined to theoreticians. The most practical people take it as a, an oddity and not very much more. But that insofar as Russia is a socialist state, this still provides a terrible cleavage and uh, a cause of, of tension which can flare up in the most unlikely places. These, however, are not the practical considerations. At the end of the Second World War, there was a suspicion on both sides, simply beginning with the very extent of the victory. For ever since 1941, the victors, the three great powers, have been held together by the need to defeat Germany. And this need imposed tremendous demands on them. Despite whatever people have said, in my opinion, none of the three great powers had any reserves about waging the war against Germany. They put the defeat of Hitler and Nazi Germany above everything else. And then suddenly, you see, Nazi Germany was defeated. Suddenly, Hitler wasn't there. The whole, the thing which had forced them together had disappeared. And although they talked at their Potsdam meeting, they talked later on about the possibility of a revived German danger, the fact is, and it's one of the revolutions of our time, the German danger has, I think, disappeared.
I didn't think that for a long time. I went on for a long time after the war being apprehensive of a revived Germany. But I now uh, admit that Germany has become a Pacific country thoroughly integrated into Western democratic ways. And with this, you see, the whole situation has been transformed. It's equally true, of course, that in the Far East, Japan has ceased to be a political and military danger, though in a sense she's still an economic rival, as, as Germany is for that matter. There was nothing to force them together. There was much to force them apart. A wide range of misunderstandings began in 1945, some of which have continued to the present day. For instance, the Russians had had the most terrible experiences, 20 million dead. Nor was this the first time that such a thing had happened to them. In fact, Russia has been invaded by one European country or another five times since the beginning of the 19th century. By Napoleon in 1812, by the British and French in 1856, by the Germans in 1914 to 1917, by the British and French again in 1919, by the Germans in 1941. Russia has never invaded Europe except in answer to the conqueror, and one can say, as a liberator. Russian troops came to Berlin in 1945, just as they had come to Paris in 1814, not as conquerors, but simply to drive the conquerors back. Or so it appears in retrospect. At the time, men feared they had come as conquerors. We shall never know, in our lifetimes, but perhaps we shall never know, what were the secret councils of the Soviet leaders in 1945, or indeed now. All those who claim to know about Soviet policy, Kremlinologists they're called, guess. That's all you can do about Russia. You may guess well. I differ from them, but only because I guess slightly differently. No one, no one, no one has any solid information about so Soviet policy from inside. You can see how it works out, but any scheme which is made is just speculation. There are those who think that in 1945, uh, Stalin and his hordes wanted to sweep right across Europe. In my opinion, and I was entitled to my opinion as others are, this was not the case. Soviet policy wanted security. The defeat of Germany, the weakening of Germany, and then the building up of a ring of satellite states which would ensure Germany's, uh, Soviet Russia's security. Far from wanting the spread of communism, and this is something we know, and could be uh, the evidence before us, Stalin deliberately prevented the possible victory of communism in both Italy and France. And it's now, I may say, much against the will of the Soviet leaders that communism is growing in strength in Italy and to a lesser extent in France. My guess is the last thing they want is to see European communist parties, partly because if any great European country went communist, it would eclipse Russia. This, however, is not what it, how it seemed to others at the time. The extensions of Russian power uh, into Czechoslovakia and Poland, these were deplored by Great Britain and still more by the United States, even though the United States policy and influence was being extended, though by different means, into Western Europe. How did Western Europe recover and be saved from communism? by American economic aid, because America attached importance to preserving Western Europe as what it still is, an American outpost. Europe was divided into, on the one hand, American outposts, and on the other hand, Soviet outposts. Neither, possibly, with any aggressive intention. There was, I think, one period of genuine Cold War. I mean by that, with one of the powers planning to take aggressive moves to drive the other back, not necessarily by war, but by overwhelming pressure. And that was in the years when the United States alone possessed nuclear weapons. We know quite well that from the moment the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, 
that American policy became tougher. There was a time when President Truman and others were envisaging that Russia would be pushed back to her 1939 frontiers. After all, President Truman, who succeeded Roosevelt by, only by the accident of Roosevelt's death, said on the outbreak of war between Russia and Germany in 1941, we should stand aside and let each of the two scoundrels cut each other's throat, supporting whichever happens to be the weaker at the moment. So he shared little appreciation for Russia, Soviet Russia, as an ally. And I would speculate also that the Berlin airlift, let's say Russian blockade of Berlin, was in part an answer to this atomic alarm. It's worth bearing in mind that the, the Berlin airlift could not have been continued for 24 hours unless the control towers, all manned by Soviet uh, observers and, and activators had been kept going. So it, it was the Russians who really conducted the Berlin airlift, as it were, or patronized it. World situation changed, changed undoubtedly, when the Russians acquired nuclear secrets of their own. Secrets, I think, which owe a great deal more to the work of Soviet scientists than to British or American uh, secret agents. From this moment, there began a balance, sometimes called a balance of power, a balance of terror. As with other weapons, it is not necessarily to be as strong, if you're on the defensive, as on the offensive. In the Second World War, it said the offensive must be five times as strong as the defensive is going to succeed in anything. And something the same can be said about the, the nuclear weapons. Russia, un almost until the present day, has not been as strong in nuclear weapons as the United States, but has been strong enough to pose some sort of threat. And in all these years, although there have been apprehensions, there has been only one, in my opinion, mistaken alarm, what's called the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, often represented as an American victory. What it secured, certainly, was the withdrawal of Soviet uh, rocket bases from Cuba. But the Americans paid a price. They acknowledged Cuba's independence. They never repeated the attempt to destroy Cuban independence, as was done by the Bay of Pigs, and there Cuba is, really under a Soviet guarantee to the present day. So it was quite an achievement in its way. I don't think it was frightfully important, you know, but it was uh, uh, an interesting experience of how near one could go to war. Other Russian activities come, in my opinion, under the heading of defensive answers. It, answers which are very tiresome to those inflicted upon them. There is, after all, a tendency for each side to nibble, uh, for each side to hope that there will be cracks in the surrounding uh, lines of, of, of division. This was true in regard to Czechoslovakia in 1948. It was true in a different way in regard to Hungary in 1946. The last time I saw President Benish of Czechoslovakia, which was in 1947, he said to me, I've always hoped that Czechoslovakia would be a link, a hyphen, between the Western powers and the Eastern powers. If now East and West quarrel, Czechoslovakia must go with Russia. As I asked him why, he said, because it's our only secure defense against the Germans. And this, I think, is a theme which is sometimes forgotten in the West. Maybe the alarm is, is now artificial, but it certainly existed at that time. The Hungarian one is, is more contentious. The Hungarian revolution, or rising, could be depicted as a movement of good Democrats. It could also be depicted, at any rate, as having been captured by those who looked back to the fascist, aristocratic, clerical-run Hungary of the interwar years. Uh, certainly, this was not, though it was a move in the Cold War, it was specifically designed uh, 
to ensure that this did not turn into a hot war. And I think once you consider this, that the, the setup is now absolutely rigid. What is happening in other parts of the world is a different matter. Though we can look forward for some years to a reasonable balance between Russia and the United States, I think the most likely lot of the most likely warlike events will again sound somewhat of an echo from the 19th century that I've been talking about. Wars of liberation have been fought in the last 30 years. Liberation of, of Vietnam, liberation of Algeria, and it may well be, though much regretted, it may well be that we shall see wars of liberation in, in Africa. But these are not something which will really deeply affect the world balance. As it now turns out, the, the Americans talk a lot of nonsense, the domino theory, that if Vietnam went, the whole of Southeast Asia would crumble away. It's turned out all that's happened by the defeat of the Americans in Vietnam is that reunited Vietnam is more a stronger and more independent country than it was before. And so I think you're bound accepting this, accepting also, of course, this, remember that many, many freaks in history. On the whole, we've done pretty well since the war in not producing any great men. Great men are absolutely splendid in wartime, may be essential, but they can be dangerous in peacetime. Great men, powerful men, have produced wars as Napoleon did. And the run of states, and we have a few statesmen left over from the war, like Mao Zedong, or the, the one survival, Marshal Tito. But on the whole, all the world statesmen now are rather humdrum, secondary people who are unlikely to aspire to be world conquerors. The one force which still aspires to conquer the world are the planning staffs. They will produce the alarms and frights. People are always asking historians, you know, to tell them about the future. Heaven knows it's bad enough to know about the past. N the historian is no more competent than anyone else to foretell the future. In fact, in many ways, he's less competent because he understands the infinite variety of what might happen. And so, if people ask me, will there be another world war? I'm inclined to answer. If men behave in the future as they have done in the past, there will be another world war. But of course, it's always possible that men may behave differently. As a personal hunch, I think it's unlikely and that there will be a third world war. One day, the deterrent will fail to deter. 